in a sense, it was what's wrong with Stephen Hawking's calculation, which is a weird thing to say sometimes because people think Stephen Hawking surely right. didn't get his math wrong. But he did, actually, in his calculation. So what he calculated back in 1973, 1974, is that a black hole, so you, you, we picture this thing from which nothing can escape, even light. So when you go in, you're gone, basically. What he calculated is that even though these things are just a distortion in space and time, that's, that's the description of them. So it's almost as if there's nothing there apart from a distortion in space and time. He calculated that they glow, so they have a temperature. So they, they emit radiation. It's called Hawking radiation. And that's so important was that discovery. If you go to Westminster Abbey in London, look on the floor of the Abbey on his memorial stone, and he's in there next to Newton and Shakespeare and all these people, and he's there. And chiseled in stone on the floor of Westminster Abbey is his equation for the temperature of a black hole. So it was this tremendously important discovery. So he, disco he discovers these things glow, and he calculates how they glow. A very low temperature, but they emit things, which means that they shrink because they're, they're emitting stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they're shrinking. So that means they have a lifetime. So first of all, one day they'll be gone. So that means that you have to address this question of what happened to all the stuff that fell in. And his calculation said that there's no record at all of anything that fell in in all this radiation that's come off the black hole. So it's, it's purely information-less radiation. So what that means is that black holes destroy information according to that calculation. And that's a big deal because nowhere else in all of physics does anything erase information from the universe. So it's really true that if I got this, this notepad and pen, right, and I, I wrote some things on it, and then I set fire to this even, just incinerated it, put it in a nuclear explosion, whatever. In principle, according to all the laws of nature that we know, if you collected everything that came off, all the radiation, all the bits of ashes and things, and you could just measure it all, then just in principle, the idea is you could reconstruct the information. So it all gets scrambled up and thrown out into, and so in practice you can't do it, but in just in principle, the laws of nature say that information is not destroyed, it's just scrambled up in a way that you can't reconstruct, right? But this calculation that Stephen did said there is no information in that radiation at all, zero, just nothing. So it seemed that uniquely in the universe, black holes erase information. When you say there's no information, like how are you measuring whether or not there's information in it? So, so really in bits, I mean, the idea is, and, it's, and I should say it's very much in principle this, so no, no one thinks in practice you could reconstruct what I wrote down on this if you set fire to it. But in principle... Well, maybe sometime in the future, maybe yeah, a million years yeah, from now. Yeah, in principle, you, you could just collect everything. Well, then somewhere in that, in that, in that, all that radiation and ashes and light that's come off the thing is the information. It's, it's there. So you could reconstruct the book or what I wrote on this page in principle. But the thing about Stephen's calculation was that even in principle, it said there is no information. And by the way, the, it's kind of easy to see why, actually, because this radiation, this Hawking radiation that comes off the black hole, it's coming from the horizon of the black hole. So I should say what the horizon is, maybe. So it's, okay. if you remember I said that this, the sun, if you squashed it down within three kilometers of radius, you, you, you'd, you'd get this kind of distortion in space and time from which if you went in across this region, three kilometers, you went inside it, you couldn't get out. So that's called the event horizon. So you wouldn't notice if you fell through the, the horizon of the black hole in, a, in the Milky Way galaxy, if you went into that one, you, we could be falling through that horizon now in this room, and we wouldn't notice anything except that we couldn't get out again. And, and ultimately, in a few hours, in, in that case, time would end for us. So we just go, you go to the end of time. This is getting quite complicated so already, isn't it? We didn't, we didn't start in a relaxing way, did we? I don't no know. need to. <laughs> no need to. Let's get right into it. So we wouldn't notice... Not for the big black holes. So, so yeah, so these supermassive black holes, you, you, we could fall across this horizon. It's just like being in empty space for us. Uh, so we just, we'd, 
we would just be talking now when we could have been talking on the outside of the horizon and by the time I finished the sentence we could be on the inside of the horizon inside the black hole and according to Einstein's theory at least which is the theory that predicted them initially we could just do that we could just go in and we wouldn't notice for a bit the, the thing we would notice ultimately is you go inexorably you, nothing you can do you go to this thing called the singularity once you've crossed the horizon and you are going to that thing and then the question arises what is that thing and one answer is we don't know but in Einstein's theory it's the end of time so it's it one way of picturing what's happened here is so distorted is space and time by the collapse of a star or the collapse of loads of stuff to make these big supermassive black holes we don't quite know how they form actually but it's collapsing stuff so it distorts space and time so much that in a, in a real sense, they kind of flip over. They, they get mixed up. And so this, this singularity, which you might have thought of as the point to which this thing collapsed, this infinitely dense point, you might think. But actually, it's more correctly to be seen as the end of time because everything's got mixed up. So you go to the end of time. And it's just like saying, the, the, why can't I escape that thing? It's like why can't we escape tomorrow right so we are going to tomorrow so to, to backtrack a bit why why does this calculation Stephen did why has it got no information why does it say there's no information in this radiation the thing is it's coming from the horizon so it's all one there's loads of ways to think about it but w one way is that th this this weird place this point of no return in space that you can fall through but it's a point of no return it sort of shakes, it almost disrupts the vacuum of space and sort of almost shakes particles out of the vacuum. That's one way of thinking about it. But this radiation is coming from the vacuum. It's coming from empty space. Whereas if you think about the thing that I throw in, if I throw this, this notepad into the thing, then that goes to the singularity. It's got nothing to do, the, the radiation's got nothing to do with this thing. This thing's not. This thing is not set on fire or something like that. It's it's gone to the end of time, and just whatever's happened to it has happened to it. So so this radiation's got nothing to do with anything that falls in at first sight, at least. And so that was the paradox. It's called the black hole information paradox. It's like it's one way to put it is the laws of nature that we use to calculate what happens tell us that information is never destroyed. And when you calculate what happens, it tells us that information is destroyed. So that's why everyone got interested in it in, in the 80s, because it's interesting. <laughs>